Section 7 of Mark the Match Boy, or Richard Hunter's Ward, by Horatio Alger, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Match Boy, or Richard Hunter's Ward, by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 13, What Befell the Match Boy. During the next three months, Mark made his home at the lodging house. He was easily able to meet the small charges of the lodge for bed and breakfast, and saved up ten dollars besides in the bank. Ben Gibson began to look upon him as quite a capitalist. "'I don't see how you save up so much money, Mark,' he said. "'You don't earn more than half as much as I do.' "'It's because you spend so much, Ben. It costs you considerable for cigars and such things, you know, and then you go to the old Bowery pretty often.' "'A feller must have some fun,' said Ben. "'They've got a tearin' old play at the Bowery now. "'You better come tonight.' "'Mark shook his head. "'I feel pretty tired when it comes night,' he said. "'I'd rather stay at home.' "'You ain't so tough as I am,' said Ben. "'No,' said Mark. "'I don't feel very strong. "'I think something's the matter with me.' "'Nothing ain't ever the matter with me,' said Ben complacently. "'But you're a puny little chap. "'That look as if you might blow away some day.' It was now April, and the weather was of that mild character that saps the strength and produces a feeling of weakness and debility. Mark had been exposed during the winter to the severity of stormy weather, and more than once got thoroughly drenched. It was an exposure that Ben would only have laughed at, but Mark was slightly built, without much strength of constitution, and he had been feeling very languid for a few days, so that it was with an effort that he dragged himself round during the day with his little bundle of matches. This conversation with Ben took place in the morning, just as both boys were going to work. They separated at the City Hall Park, Ben finding a customer in front of the Times building, while Mark, after a little deliberation, decided to go on to Pearl Street with his matches. He had visited the offices in most of the lower streets, but this was a new region to him, and he thought he might meet with better success there, so he kept on his way. The warm sun and the sluggish air made his head ache, and he felt little disposition to offer his wares for sale. He called at one or two offices, but effected no sales. At length he reached a large warehouse with these names displayed on the sign over the door, Rockwell and Cooper. This, as the reader will remember, was the establishment in which Richard Hunter, formerly Ragged Dick, was now bookkeeper. At this point a sudden faintness came over Mark, and he sank to the ground insensible. A moment before Richard Hunter handed a couple of letters to the office boy, known to the readers of the earlier volumes in this series as Mickey McGuire, and said, Michael, I should like to have you carry these at once to the post office. On the way, you may stop at Trescott and Wayne's and get this bill cashed, if possible. All right, Mr. Hunter, said Michael respectfully. Richard Hunter and Mickey McGuire had been boot blacks together, and had had more than one contest for the supremacy. They had been sworn enemies, and Mickey had done his utmost to injure Richard, but the latter, by his magnanimity, had finally wholly overcome the antipathy of his former foe, and when opportunity offered, had lifted him to a position in the office where he was himself employed. In return, Mickey had become an enthusiastic admirer of Richard, and so far from taking advantage of their former relations, had voluntarily taken up the habit of addressing him as Mr. Hunter. Michael went out on his errand, but just outside the door came near stepping upon the prostrate form of the little match boy. "'Get up here,' he said roughly, supposing at first that Mark had thrown himself down out of laziness and gone to sleep. Mark did not answer, and Mickey, bending over, saw his fixed expression in waxen pallor. "'Maybe the little chap's dead,' he thought, startled, and without more ado took him up in his strong arms and carried him into the counting-room. "'Who have you got there, Michael?' asked Richard Hunter, turning round in surprise. "'A little match-boy that was lying just outside the door. He looks as if he might be dead.' Richard jumped at once from his stool, and approaching the boy looked earnestly in his face. "'He has fainted away,' he said after a pause. "'Bring some water, quick!' Mickey brought a glass of water, which was thrown into the face of Mark. The match boy gave a little shiver, and opening his eyes, fixed them upon Richard Hunter. "'Where am I?' he asked vacantly. "'You are with friends,' said Richard gently. "'You are found at our door faint. Do you feel sick?' "'I feel weak,' said Mark. "'Have you been well lately?' "'No, I've felt tired and weak. Are you a match boy?' "'Yes.' "'Have you parents living?' "'No,' said Mark. "'Poor fellow,' said Richard. "'I know how to pity you. I have no parents either.' "'But you have got money,' said Mark. "'You don't have to live in the street.' 
I was once a street boy like you. You? repeated the match boy in surprise. Yes, but where do you sleep? At the lodging house. It is a good place. Michael, you had better go to the post office now. Mark looked about him a little anxiously. Where are my matches? he asked. Just outside. I'll get them, said Michael promptly. He brought them in and then departed on his errand. I guess I'd better be going, said Mark, rising feebly. No, said Richard. You are not able. Come here and sit down. You will feel stronger by and by. Did you eat any breakfast this morning? A little, said Mark, but I was not very hungry. Do you think you could eat anything now? Mark shook his head. No, he said. I don't feel hungry. I only feel tired. Would you like to rest? Yes, that's all I want. Come here then, and I will see what I can do for you. Mark followed his new friend into the warehouse, where Richard found a soft bale of cotton and told Mark he might lie down upon it. This the poor boy was glad enough to do. In his weakness he was disposed to sleep and soon closed his eyes in slumber. Several times Richard went out to look at him, but found him dozing and was unwilling to interrupt him. The day wore away and afternoon came. Mark got up from his cotton bale and with unsteady steps came to the door of the counting room. I'm going, he said. Richard turned around. Where are you going? I'm going to the lodge. I think I won't sell any more matches today. I'll take all you've left, said Richard. Don't trouble yourself about them. But you are not going to the lodge. Mark looked at him in surprise. I shall take you home with me tonight, he said. You are not well, and I will look after you. At the lodge there will be a crowd of boys, and the noise will do you harm. You are very kind, said Mark, but I'm afraid I'll trouble you. No, said Richard. I shan't count it a trouble. I was once a poor boy like you, and I found friends. I'll be your friend. Go back and lie down again, and in about an hour I shall be ready to take you with me. It seems strange to Mark to think that there was somebody who proposed to protect and look after him. In many of the offices which he visited he met with rough treatment and was ordered out of the way, as if he were a dog and without human feelings. Many who treated him in this way were really kind-hearted men who had at home children whom they loved, but they appeared to forget that these neglected children of the street had feelings and wants as well as their own, who were tenderly nurtured. They did not remember that they were somebody's children, and that cold and harshness and want were as hard for them to bear as for those in a higher rank of life. But Mark was in that state of weakness when it seemed sweet to throw off all care or thought for the future, and to sink back upon the soft bale with the thought that he had nothing to do but to rest. That boy is going to be sick, thought Richard Hunter to himself. I think he is going to have a fever. It was because of this thought that he decided to carry him home. He had a kind heart, and he knew how terrible a thing sickness is to these little street waifs who have no mother or sister to smooth their pillows or cheer them with gentle words. The friendless condition of the little match boy touched his heart, and he resolved that, as he had the means of taking care of him, he would do so. Michael, he said at the close of business hours, I wish you would call a hack. What, to come here? asked Mickey, surprised. Yes, I am going to take that little boy home with me. I think he is going to be sick, and I am afraid he would have a hard time of it if I sent him back into the street. Bully for you, Mr. Hunter, said Mickey, who, though rough in his outward manners, was yet capable of appreciating kindness in others. There were times, indeed, in the past when he had treated smaller boys brutally, but it was under the influence of passion. He had improved greatly since, and his better nature was beginning to show itself. Mickey went out and soon returned in state inside a hack. He was leaning back, thinking it would be a very good thing if he had a carriage of his own to ride in, but I am afraid that day will never come. Mickey has already turned out much better than was expected, but he is hardly likely to rise much higher than the subordinate position he now occupies. In capacity and education, he is far inferior to his old associate, Richard Hunter, who is destined to rise much higher than at present. Richard Hunter went to the rear of the warehouse, where Mark still lay on his bale. Come, he said, we'll go home now. Mark rose from his recumbent position and walked to the door. He saw with surprise the carriage, the door of which Mickey McGuire held open. Are we going to ride in that, he asked? Yes, said Richard Hunter. Let me help you in. The little match boy sank back in the soft seat in vague surprise at his good luck. He could not help wondering what Ben Gibson would say if he could see him now. Richard Hunter sat beside him and supported Mark's head. The driver whipped up his horse, and they were speedily on their way up the Bowery to St. Mark's Place. Chapter 14. Richard Hunter's Ward. It was about half-past five o'clock in the afternoon when the carriage containing Richard Hunter and the match boy stopped in front of his boarding place in St. Mark's Place. 
Richard helped the little boy out, saying cheerfully, Well, we've got home. Is this where you live? asked Mark faintly. Yes. How do you like it? It's a nice place. I'm afraid you are taking too much trouble about me. Don't think of that. Come in. Richard had ascended the front steps after paying the hackman, and taking out his night key opened the outside door. Come upstairs, he said. They ascended two flights of stairs, and Richard threw open the door of his room. A fire was already burning in the grate, and it looked bright and cheerful. Do you feel tired? asked Richard. Yes, a little. Then lie right down on the bed. You are hungry, too, are you not? A little. I will have something sent up to you. Just then, Fosdick, who it will be remembered was Richard Hunter's roommate, entered the room. He looked with surprise at Mark, and then inquiringly at Richard. It is a little match boy, explained the latter, who fell in a fainting fit in front of our office. I think the poor fellow is going to be sick, so I brought him home, and mean to take care of him till he is well. You must let me share the expense, Dick, said Fosdick. No, but I'll let you share the care of him. That will do just as well. But I would rather share the expense. He reminds me of the way I was situated when I fell in with you. What is your name? Mark Manton, said the match boy. I've certainly seen him somewhere before, said Fosdick reflectively. His face looks familiar to me. So it does to me. Perhaps I've seen him about the street somewhere. I have it, said Fosdick suddenly. Don't you remember the boy we saw sleeping in the cabin of the Fulton ferry boat? Yes. I think he is the one. Mark, he continued, turning to the match boy, didn't you sleep one night on a Brooklyn ferry boat about three months ago? Yes, said Mark. And did you find anything in your vest pocket in the morning? Yes, said the match boy with interest. I found a dollar and didn't know where it came from. Was it you that put it in? He had a hand in it, said Fosdick, pointing with a smile to his roommate. I was very glad to get it, said Mark. I only had eight cents besides, and that gave me enough to buy some matches. That was at the time I ran away. Who did you run away from? From Mother Watson. Mother Watson, repeated Dick. I wonder if I don't know her. She's a very handsome old lady with a fine red complexion, particularly about the nose. Yes, said Mark with a smile. And she takes whiskey when she can get it? Yes. How did you fall in with her? She promised to take care of me when my mother died, but instead of that she wanted me to earn money for her. Yes, she was always a very disinterested old lady, so it appears you didn't like her as a guardian. No. Then suppose you take me. Would you like to be my ward? I think I would, but I don't know what it means, said Mark. It means that I am to look after you, said Dick, just as if I was your uncle or grandfather. You may call me grandfather if you want to. Oh, you're too young, said Mark, amused in spite of his weakness. Then we won't decide just at present about the name, but I forgot all about your being hungry. I'm not very hungry. At any rate, you haven't had anything to eat since morning and need something. I'll go down and see Mrs. Wilson about it. Richard Hunter soon explained matters to Mrs. Wilson, to whom he offered to pay an extra weekly sum for Mark, and arranged that a small single bed should be placed in one corner of the room temporarily in which the match boy should sleep. He speedily reappeared with a bowl of broth, a cup of tea, and some dry toast. The sight of these caused the match boy's eyes to brighten, and he was able to do very good justice to it all. Now, said Richard Hunter, I will call in a doctor and find out what is the matter with my little ward. In the course of the evening, Dr. Pemberton, a young dispensary physician whose acquaintance Richard had casually made, called at his request and looked at the patient. He is not seriously sick, he pronounced. It is chiefly debility that troubles him, brought on probably by exposure and overexertion in this languid spring weather. Then you don't think he's going to have a fever, said Dick. No, not if he remains under your care. Had he continued in the street, I think he would not have escaped one. What shall we do for him? Rest is most important of all. That, with nourishing food and freedom from exposure, will soon bring him round again. He shall have all these. I suppose you know him, as you take so much interest in him. No, I never saw him but once before today, but I am able to befriend him, and he has no other friends. There are not many young men who would take all this trouble about a poor match boy, said the doctor. It's because they don't know how hard it is to be friendless and neglected, said Dick. I've known that feeling, and it makes me pity those who are in the same condition I once was. I wish there were more like you, Mr. Hunter, said Dr. Pemberton. There would be less suffering in the world. As to our little patient here, I have no doubt he will do well and soon be on his legs again. Indeed, Mark was already looking better and feeling better. The rest which he had obtained during the day and the refreshment he had just taken were precisely what he needed. 
He soon fell asleep, and Richard and Fosdick, lighting the gas lamp on the centre table, sat down to their evening studies. In a few days Mark was decidedly better, but it was thought best that he should still keep the room. He liked it very well in the evening when Dick and Fosdick were at home, but he felt rather lonesome in the daytime. Richard Hunter thought of this one day and said, "'Can you read, Mark?' "'Yes,' said the match boy. "'Who taught you? Not Mother Watson, surely.' "'No, she couldn't read herself. It was my mother who taught me. "'I think I must get you two or three books of stories "'to read while we are away in the daytime. "'You are spending too much money for me, Mr. Hunter. "'Remember, I am your guardian, and it is my duty to take care of you.' "'The next morning on his way downtown, "'Richard Hunter stepped into a retail bookstore on Broadway. "'As he entered, a boy, if indeed it be allowable "'to apply such a term to a personage so consequential in his manners, "'came forward.' what roswell crawford are you here asked richard hunter in surprise roswell who has already been mentioned in this story and who figured considerably in previous volumes of this series answered rather stiffly to this salutation yes he said i am here for a short time i came in to oblige mr baker you are always very obliging roswell said richard good-humouredly roswell did not appear to appreciate this compliment he probably thought it savoured of irony "'Do you want to buy anything this morning?' he said shortly. "'Yes. I would like to look at some books of fairy stories.' "'For your own reading, I suppose,' said Roswell. "'I may read them, but I'm getting them for my ward. "'Is he a boot black? sneered Roswell, who knew all about Dick's early career. "'No,' said Richard. "'He's a match boy. "'So if you've got any books that you can warrant to be just the thing for match boys, "'I should like to see them.' "'We don't have many customers of that class,' said Roswell unpleasantly. "'They generally go to cheaper establishments when they are able to read.' "'Do they?' said Dick. "'I'm glad you've got into a place where you only meet the cream of society.' And Dick glanced significantly at a red-nosed man who came in to buy a couple of sheets of notepaper. Roswell colored. "'There are some exceptions,' he said, and glanced pointedly at Richard Hunter himself. Well, said Dick, after looking over a collection of juvenile books, I'll take these two. He drew out his pocketbook and handed Roswell a ten-dollar bill. Roswell changed it with a feeling of jealousy and envy. He was the son of a gentleman, as he often boasted, but he never had a ten-dollar bill in his pocket. Indeed, he was now working for six dollars a week and glad to get that after having been out of a situation for several months. Just then, Mr. Gladden, of the large downtown firm of Gladden and Company, came into the store, and seeing Richard, saluted him cordially. "'How are you this morning, Mr. Hunter?' he said. "'Are you on your way downtown?' "'Yes, sir,' said Richard. "'Come with me. We'll take an omnibus together.' And the two walked out of the store in familiar conversation. "'I shouldn't think such a man as Mr. Gladden would notice a low boot black," said Roswell bitterly. The rest of the day he was made unhappy by the thought of Dick's prosperity and his own hard fate in being merely a clerk in a bookstore with a salary of six dollars a week. End of section seven of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger Jr. Recording by Tori Falder. Section eight of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 15. Mark Gets a Place. In a week from the purchase of the books, Mark felt that he was fully recovered. He never had much color, but the unhealthy pallor had left his cheeks, and he had an excellent appetite. "'Well, Mark, how do you feel tonight?' asked Richard, on his return from the store one evening. "'I'm all right now, Mr. Hunter. I think I will go to work tomorrow morning.' "'What sort of work? Selling matches? Do you like to sell matches? "'I like it better than selling papers or blacking boots. "'But wouldn't you like better to be in a store?' "'I couldn't get a place,' said Mark. "'Why not?' "'My clothes are ragged,' said the match boy with some hesitation. "'Besides, I haven't got anybody to refer to.' "'Can't you refer to your guardian?' asked Richard Hunter, smiling. "'Do you think I had better try to get a place in a store, Mr. Hunter?' asked Mark. "'Yes. I think it would be much better for you than to sell matches on the street. "'You are not a strong boy, and the exposure is not good for you. "'As to your clothes, we'll see if we cannot supply you with something better than you have on.' "'But,' said Mark, "'I want to pay for my clothes myself. "'I have got ten dollars in the bank at the newsboy's lodge.' 
Very well, you can go down tomorrow morning and get it, but we needn't wait for that. I will go and get you some clothes before I go to business. In the morning, Richard Hunter went out with the match boy, and for twenty dollars obtained for him a very neat gray suit, besides a supply of underclothing. Mark put them on at once and felt not a little pleased with the improvement in his appearance. You can carry your old clothes to Mr. O'Connor, said Richard. They are not very good, but they are better than none, and he may have an opportunity of giving them away. You have been very kind to me, Mr. Hunter, said Mark gratefully. Good-bye. Good-bye? What makes you say that? Because I am going now to the Newsboys' Lodge. Yes, but you are coming back again. But I think I had better go there to live now. It will be much cheaper, and I ought not to put you to so much expense. You're a good boy, Mark, but you must remember that I am your guardian, and am to be obeyed as such. You're not going back to the lodge to live. I have arranged to have you stay with me at my boarding place. As soon as you have got a place you will work in the daytime, and every Saturday night you will bring me your money. In the evening I shall have you study a little, for I don't want you to grow up as ignorant as I was at your age. Were you ignorant, Mr. Hunter? asked Mark with interest. Yes, I was, said Richard. When I was fourteen, I couldn't read nor write. I can hardly believe that, Mr. Hunter, said Mark. You're such a fine scholar. Am I? asked Richard, smiling, yet well pleased with the compliment. Why, you can read French as fast as I can read English, and write beautifully. Well, I had to work hard to do it, said Richard Hunter, but I feel paid for all the time I've spent in trying to improve myself. Sometimes I've thought I should like to spend the evening at some place of amusement rather than in study, but if I had, there'd be nothing to show for it now. Take my advice, Mark, and study all you can, and you'll grow up respectable and respected. Now, he added after a pause, I'll tell you what you may do. You may look in my herald every morning, and whenever you see a boy advertised for, you can call, or whenever, in going along the street, you see a notice boy wanted, you may call in, and sooner or later you'll get something. If they ask for references, you may refer to Richard Hunter, bookkeeper for Rockwell and Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Hunter, said Mark. I will do so. On parting with his guardian, the match boy went downtown to the lodging house. The superintendent received him kindly. I didn't know what had become of you, Mark, he said. If it had been some of the boys, I should have been afraid they had gotten into a scrape and gone to the island, but I didn't think that of you. I hope you'll never hear that of me, Mr. O'Connor, said Mark. I hope not. I'm always sorry to hear of any boys going astray. But you seem to have been doing well since I saw you. And the superintendent glanced at Mark's new clothes. I've met with some kind friends, said the match boy. I have been sick, and they took care of me. And now you have come back to the lodge? Yes, but not to stay. I came for the money that I have saved up in the bank. It is going for these clothes. Very well, you shall have it. What is the name of the friend who has taken care of you? Richard Hunter. I know him, said the superintendent. He is an excellent young man. You could not be in better hands. On leaving the lodge, Mark felt a desire to find his old ally, Ben Gibson, who, though rather a rough character, had been kind to him. Ben was not difficult to find. During business hours, he was generally posted on Nassau Street, somewhere between Fulton Street and Spruce Street. He was just polishing off a customer's boots when Mark came up and touched him lightly on the shoulder. Ben looked up, but did not at first recognize the match boy in the neatly dressed figure before him. Shine your boots, he asked in a professional tone. Why, Ben, don't you know me? asked Mark, laughing. My eyes, if it ain't Mark the match boy, exclaimed Ben in surprise. Where have you been all this while, Mark? I've been sick, Ben. I'd like to be sick, too, if that's the way you got them clothes. I didn't know what had come of you. I found some good friends, said Mark. If your friends have got any more good clothes they want to get rid of, said Ben, tell them you know a chap that can take care of a few. Are you in the match business now? I haven't been doing anything for three weeks, said Mark. Going to sell matches again? No. Selling papers? No. I'm trying to find a place in a store. I don't think I'd like to be in a store, said Ben reflectively. I'm afraid my delicate constitution couldn't stand the confinement. Besides, I'm my own boss now, and don't have nobody to order me round. But you don't expect to black boots all your life, Ben, do you? I don't know, said Ben. Maybe when I'm married I'll choose some other business. It would be rather hard to support a family at five cents a shine. Are you coming to the lodge tonight? No, said Mark. I'm boarding up at St. Mark's Place. Mother Watson hasn't opened a fashionable boarding house up there, has she? I guess not, said Mark, smiling. I can't think of what has become of her. I haven't seen her since the day she tried to carry me off. 
"'I've heard of her,' said Ben. "'She's stopping with some friends at the island. "'They won't let her come away on account of liking her company so much.' "'I hope I shall never see her again,' said Mark with a shudder. "'She's a wicked old woman, but I must be going, Ben. "'I suppose you'll come and see a feller now and then?' "'Yes, Ben, when I get time, but I hope to get a place soon.' Mark walked leisurely up Broadway. Having been confined to the house for three weeks, he enjoyed the excitement of being out in the street once more. The shop windows looked brighter and gayer than before, and the little match boy felt that the world was a very pleasant place after all. He had passed Eighth Street before he was fairly aware of the distance he had traversed. He found himself looking into the window of a bookstore. While examining the articles in the window, his eye suddenly caught the notice pasted in the middle of the glass on a piece of white paper. Boy wanted. Perhaps they'll take me, thought Mark suddenly. At any rate, I'll go in and see. Accordingly, he entered the store and looked about him a little undecidedly. Well, Sonny, what do you want? asked a clerk. I see that you want a boy, said Mark. "'Yes. Do you want a place?' "'I'm trying to get one.' "'Well, go and see that gentleman about it.' He pointed to a gentleman who was seated at a desk in the corner of the store. "'Please, sir, do you want a boy?' he asked. "'Yes,' said the gentleman. "'How old are you?' Ten years old.' "'You are rather young. Have you been in any place before?' "'No, sir. Do you know your way about the city pretty well?' "'Yes, sir.' I want a boy to deliver papers and magazines and carry small parcels of books. Do you think you could do that? Yes, sir. Without stopping to play on the way? Yes, sir. I have just discharged one boy because he was gone an hour and a half on an errand to 20th Street. You are the first boy that has answered my advertisement. I'll try you on a salary of three dollars a week if you can go to work at once. What is your name? Mark Manton. Very well, Mark. Go to Mr. Jones behind the counter there, and he will give you a parcel to carry to West 21st Street. I'm in luck, thought Mark. I didn't expect to get a place so easily. Chapter 16. Mark's First Impressions. Probably my readers already understand that the bookstore in which Mark has secured a place is the same in which Roswell Crawford is employed. This circumstance, if Mark had only known it, was likely to make his position considerably less desirable than it would otherwise have been. Mr. Baker, the proprietor of the store, was very considerate in his treatment of those in his employ, and Mr. Jones, his chief clerk, was good-natured and pleasant. But Roswell was very apt to be insolent and disagreeable to those who were, or whom he considered to be, in an inferior position to himself, while his lofty ideas of his own dignity and social position as the son of a gentleman made him not very desirable as a clerk. Still, he had learned something from his bad luck thus far, he had been so long in getting his present place that he felt it prudent to sacrifice his pride in some extent for the sake of retaining it. But if he could neglect his duties without attracting attention, he resolved to do it, feeling that six dollars was a beggarly salary for a young gentleman of his position and capacity. It was unfortunate for him, and a source of considerable annoyance, that he could get no one except his mother to assent to his own estimate of his abilities. Even his cousin Gilbert, who had been Rockwell and Cooper's bookkeeper before Richard Hunter succeeded to the position, did not conceal his poor opinion of Roswell. But this the latter attributed to prejudice, being persuaded in his own mind that his cousin was somewhat inclined to be envious of his superior abilities. At the time that Mark was so suddenly engaged by Mr. Baker, Roswell had gone out to dinner. When he returned, Mark had gone out with the parcel to West 21st Street, so they missed each other just at first. "'Well, Crawford,' said Mr. Jones, as Roswell re-entered the store, "'Mr. Baker has engaged a new boy.' "'Has he? What sort of a fellow is he?' "'A little fellow. He doesn't look as if he's more than ten years old. "'Where is he?' "'Mr. Baker sent him on an errand to 21st Street.' "'Humph!' said Roswell, a little discontented. "'I was going to recommend a friend of mine. "'There may be a chance yet. This boy may not suit.' In about five minutes, Mr. Baker and Mr. Jones both went out to dinner. It was the middle of the day when there is very little business, and it would not be difficult for Roswell to attend to any customers who might call. As soon as he was left alone, Roswell got an interesting book from the shelves, and sitting down in his employer's chair began to read, though this was against the rules in business hours. To see the pompous air with which Roswell threw himself back in his chair, it might have been supposed that he was the proprietor of the establishment, though I believe it is true as a general rule that employers are not in the habit of putting on so many airs unless the position is a new one, and they have not yet got over the new feeling of importance which it is apt to inspire at first. 
While Roswell was thus engaged, Mark returned from his errand. He looked about him in some uncertainty on entering the store, not seeing either Mr. Baker or the chief clerk. "'Come here,' said Roswell, in a tone of authority. Mark walked up to the desk. "'So you are the new boy,' said Roswell, after a close scrutiny. "'Yes. It would be a little more polite to say yes, sir.' "'Yes, sir. What is your age?' Ten years.' "'Humph! You are rather young. If I had been consulted, I should have said get a boy of twelve years old.' "'I hope I shall suit,' said Mark. "'I hope so,' said Roswell, patronizingly. "'You will find us very easy to get along with, if you do your duty. "'We were obliged to send away a boy this morning "'because he played instead of going on his errands at once.' "'Mark could not help wondering what was Roswell's position in the establishment. "'He talked as if he were one of the proprietors, "'but his youthful appearance made it difficult to suppose that. "'What is your name?' continued Roswell. "'Mark Manton. "'Have you been in any place before?' "'No, sir. "'Do you live with your parents?' "'My parents are dead. "'Then whom do you live with?' "'With my guardian.' "'So you have a guardian,' said Roswell, a little surprised. "'What is his name?' "'Mr. Hunter.' "'Hunter?' repeated Roswell hastily. "'What is his first name?' "'Richard, I believe.' "'Dick Hunter!' exclaimed Roswell scornfully. "'Do you mean to say that he has charge of you?' "'Yes,' said Mark firmly, "'for he perceived the tone in which his friend was referred to "'and resented it. Moreover, the new expression which came over Roswell's face brought back to his recollection the evening when, for the first time in his life, he had begged in Fulton Market and been scornfully repulsed by Roswell and his mother. Roswell's face had at first seemed familiar to him, but it was only now that he recognized him. Roswell, on the other hand, was not likely to identify the neatly dressed boy before him with the shivering little beggar of the market, but it recurred to him all at once that Dick had referred to his ward as a match boy. "'You were a match-boy,' he said in a manner of one making a grave accusation. "'Yes, sir. Then why didn't you keep on selling matches and not try to get a place in a respectable store?' "'Because Mr. Hunter thought it better for me to go into a store.' "'Mr. Hunter, perhaps you don't know that your guardian, as you call him, used to be a boot-black.' "'Yes, he told me so.' "'They called him Ragged Dick then,' said Roswell, turning up his nose. "'He couldn't read or write, I believe.' "'He's a good scholar now,' said Mark. "'Humph! I suppose he told you so. "'But you mustn't believe all he tells you.' "'He wouldn't tell anything but the truth,' said Mark, "'who was bolder in behalf of his friend "'than he would have been for himself. "'So he did tell you he was a good scholar. "'I thought so. "'No, he told me nothing about it, "'but since I have lived with him, "'I've heard him read French as well as English. "'Perhaps that isn't saying much,' said Roswell with a sneer. "'Can you read yourself?' "'Yes.' That is more than I expected. What induced Mr. Baker to take a boy from the street is more than I can tell. I suppose I can run errands just as well if I was once a match boy, said Mark, who did not fancy the tone which Roswell assumed towards him, and began to doubt whether he was a person of as much importance as he at first supposed. We shall see, said Roswell loftily, but there's one thing I'll advise you, young man, and that is to treat me with proper respect. You'll find it best to keep friends with me. I can get you turned away any time. Mark hardly knew whether to believe this or not. He already began to suspect that Roswell was something of a humbug, and though it was not in his nature to form a causeless dislike, he certainly did not feel disposed to like Roswell. He did not care as much for any slighting remarks upon himself as for the scorn with which Roswell saw fit to speak of his friend, Richard Hunter, who by his good offices had won the little boy's lasting gratitude. Mark did not reply to the threat contained in these last words of Roswell. "'Is there anything for me to do?' he asked. "'Yes, you may dust off those books on the counter. There's the duster hanging up.' This was really Roswell's business, and he ought to have been at work in this way instead of reading, but it was characteristic of him to shift his duties upon others. He was not aware of how much time had passed, and supposed that Mark would be through before Mr. Barker returned. But that gentleman came in while Roswell was busily engaged in reading." "'Is that the way you do your work, Roswell?' asked his employer. Roswell jumped to his feet in some confusion. "'I thought I had better set the new boy to work,' he said. "'Dusting the books is your work, not his.' "'He was doing nothing, sir. He will have plenty to do in carrying out parcels. Besides, I don't know that it is any worse for him to be idle than you. You were reading also, which you know is against the rules of the store.' Roswell made no reply, but it hurt his pride considerably, to be censured thus in presence of Mark, 
to whom he had spoken with such an assumption of power and patronage. I wish I had a store of my own, he thought discontentedly. Then I could do as I please without having anybody to interfere with me. But Roswell did not understand, and there are plenty of boys in the same state of ignorance, that those who fill subordinate positions acceptably are more likely to rise to stations where they will themselves have control over others. I suppose you have not been to dinner, said Mr. Baker, turning to Mark. No, sir. You board in St. Mark's Place, I think you said. Yes, sir. Very well. Here is a parcel to go to East Ninth Street. You may call and leave that at the address marked upon it, and may stay out long enough for dinner, but don't be gone more than an hour in all. No, sir. I am glad that boy isn't my employer, thought Mark, referring, of course, to Roswell Crawford, who, by the way, would have been indignant at such an appellation. I like Mr. Baker a great deal better. Mark was punctual to his appointment, and in less than an hour reported himself at the store again for duty. End of section 8 of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Recording by Tori Falder. Section 9 of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 17. Bad Advice. Roswell pursued his way home with a general sense of discontent. Why should he be so much worse off than Richard Hunter, who had only been a ragged bootblack three years before? The whole world seemed to be in a conspiracy to advance Richard and to keep him down. To think he should be only earning six dollars a week, while Dick, whom he considered so far beneath him, was receiving twenty was really outrageous, and now he had pushed a low dependent of his into Baker's store, where Roswell was obliged to associate with him. Certainly Roswell's grievances were numerous, but there was one thing he did not understand, that the greatest obstacle to his advancement was himself. If he had entered any situation with the determination to make his services valuable, and discharge his duties, whatever they might be, with conscientious fidelity, he would have found his relations with his employer much more agreeable and satisfactory. Mrs. Crawford still kept the house in Clinton Place, letting nearly all the rooms to lodgers. In this way she succeeded in making both ends meet, though with considerable difficulty, so that she had not the means to supply Roswell with the spending money he desired. Her nephew, James Gilbert, Richard Hunter's predecessor as bookkeeper, still boarded with her. It will be remembered by the readers of fame and fortune that this Gilbert, on being questioned by Mr. Rockwell as to his share in the plot against Dick, had angrily resigned his position, thinking probably that he should lose it at any rate. It so happened that business was generally depressed at this time, and it was three months before he succeeded in obtaining another place, and then he was compelled to work for eight hundred dollars, or two hundred less than he had formerly received. This was a great disappointment to him, and did not help his temper much, which had never been very sweet. He felt quite exasperated against Dick, whom, very much against his wishes, he had seen the means of promoting to his own place. Indeed, on this point, he sympathized heartily with Roswell, whose dislike to Richard Hunter has already been shown. "'Well, mother,' said Roswell, as he entered Mrs. Crawford's presence, "'I'm getting tired of Baker's store.' "'Don't say so, Roswell,' said his mother in alarm. "'Remember how long it took you to get the place?' "'I have to work like a dog for six dollars a week,' said Roswell. "'Yes,' said his cousin with a sneer. "'That's precisely the way you work. "'Dogs spend their time running round the street doing nothing.' "'Well, I have to work hard enough,' said Roswell. "'But I wouldn't mind that so much "'if I didn't have to associate with low match boys.' "'What do you mean, Roswell?' asked his mother, "'who did not understand the illusion. Baker hired a new boy today, and who do you think he turns out to be? Not that boy Ragged Dick. No, you don't think he would give up Cousin James's place where he gets a thousand dollars a year to go into Baker's as a boy. Who was it then? He used to be a ragged match boy about the streets. Dick Hunter picked him up somewhere and got him a situation in our store on purpose to spite me, I expect. As the reader is aware, Roswell was mistaken on his supposition, as Mark obtained the place on his own responsibility. The boot black seems to be putting on airs, said Mrs. Crawford. Yes, he pretends to be the guardian of this match boy. What's the boy's name? 
Mark Manton. If I were Mr. Baker, said Mrs. Crawford, I should be afraid to take a street boy into my employ. Very likely he isn't honest. I wish he would steal something, said Roswell, not very charitably. Then we could get rid of him, and the boot black would be pretty well mortified about it. He'll be found out sooner or later, said Mrs. Crawford. You may depend on that. You'd better keep a sharp lookout for him, Roswell. If you catch him in stealing, it will help you with Mr. Baker, or ought to. This would have comforted Roswell more, but that he was privately of opinion that Mark was honest and would not be likely to give him any chance of detecting him in stealing. Still, by a little management on his part, he might cause him to fall under suspicion. It would, of course, be miserably mean on his part to implicate a little boy in a false charge, but Roswell was a mean boy, and he was not scrupulous where his dislike was concerned. He privately decided to think over this new plan for getting Mark into trouble. "'Isn't dinner ready, mother?' he asked rather impatiently. "'It will be in about ten minutes. I'm as hungry as a bear. You can always do your part at the table,' said his cousin unpleasantly. "'I don't know why I shouldn't. I have to work hard enough. You are always talking about your hard work. My belief is that you don't earn your wages.' "'I should think it was a pity if I didn't earn six dollars a week,' said Roswell." "'Come, James, you're always hard on Roswell,' said Mrs. Crawford. "'I am sure he has hard times enough without his own relations turning against him.' James Gilbert did not reply. He was naturally of a sarcastic turn, and seeing Roswell's faults was not inclined to spare them. He might have pointed them out, however, in a kindly manner, and then his young cousin might possibly have been benefited, but Gilbert felt very little interest in Roswell. Immediately after dinner, Roswell took up his cap. His mother observed this and inquired, "'Where are you going, Roswell?' "'I'm going out to walk. Why don't you go with your cousin?' James Gilbert had also taken his hat. "'He don't want to be bothered with me,' said Roswell, and this statement Gilbert did not take the trouble to contradict. "'Why can't you stay in and read? I haven't got anything to read. Besides, I've been cooped up in the store all day, and I want to breathe a little fresh air.' There was reason in this, and his mother did not gainsay it, but still she felt that it was not quite safe for a boy to spend his evenings out in a large city without anyone to look after him. Roswell crossed Broadway and, proceeding down 8th Street, met a boy of about his own age in front of the Cooper Institute. "'How long have you been waiting, Ralph?' he asked. "'Not long. I only just came up. I couldn't get away as soon as I expected. Dinner was rather late.' "'Have a cigar, Roswell,' asked Ralph. "'Yes,' said Roswell. "'I don't mind.' You'll find these cigars pretty good. I paid ten cents apiece. I don't see how you can afford it, said Roswell. Your cigars must cost you considerable. I don't always buy ten centers. Generally, I pay only five cents. Well, that mounts up when you smoke three or four in a day. Let me see. What wages do you get? Seven dollars a week. That's only a dollar more than I get, said Roswell. I know one thing. It's miserably small, said Ralph. We ought to get twice what we do. These shopkeepers are awfully mean, said Roswell, beginning to puff away at his cigar. That's so. But still, you always seem to have plenty of money. That's what puzzles me, said Roswell. I'm always pinched. I have to pay my mother all my wages but a dollar a week. And what's a dollar? He repeated scornfully. Well, said Ralph, my board costs me all but a dollar. So we are about even there. Do you pay your board out of your earnings? I have to. My governor won't foot the bills, so I have to. "'Still, you seem to have plenty of money,' persisted Roswell. "'Yes, I look out for that,' said Ralph Graham significantly. "'But I don't see how you manage. "'I might look out all day, and I wouldn't be any the better off.' "'Perhaps you don't go the right way to work,' said his companion, "'taking the cigar from his mouth and knocking off the ashes. "'Then I wish you'd tell me the right way.' "'Why, the fact is,' said Ralph slowly, "'I make my employer pay me higher wages than he thinks he does.' "'I don't see how you can do that,' said Roswell, who didn't yet understand. Ralph took the cigar, now nearly smoked out from his mouth, and threw it on the pavement. He bent towards Roswell and whispered something in his ear. Roswell started and turned pale. "'But,' he said, "'that's dishonest.' "'Hush,' said Ralph. "'Don't speak so loud. Oughtn't employers to pay fair wages? Tell me that.' "'Certainly. But if they don't and won't, what then?' "'I don't know.' Well, I do. We must help ourselves, that is all. But, said Roswell, what would be thought of you if it were found out? There's plenty of clerks that do it. Bless you, it's expected. I heard a man say once that he expected to lose about so much by his clerks. But I think it would be better to pay good wages. So do I. Only, you see, they won't do it. How much do you... 
do you make outside of your salary? asked Roswell. From three to five dollars a week. I should think they'd find you out. I don't let them. I'm pretty careful. Well, what shall we do this evening? There's a pretty good play at Niblo's. Suppose we go there. I haven't got money enough, said Roswell. Well, I'll pay for both tonight. You can pay another time. All right, said Roswell, though he did not know when he should have money enough to return the favor. They crossed to Broadway and walked leisurely to Niblo's garden. The performance lasted till late, and it was after eleven when Roswell Crawford got to bed. Chapter 18. The First Step. To do Roswell Crawford justice, the idea of taking money from his employer had never occurred to him until the day when it was suggested to him by Ralph Graham. The suggestion came to him at an unfortunate time. He had always felt with a sense of bitter injustice that his services were poorly compensated and that his employer was making money out of him. Yet he knew very well that there was no chance of an advance. Besides, he really felt the need of more money to keep up appearances equal to Ralph Graham and some other not very creditable acquaintances that he had managed to pick up. So Roswell allowed Ralph's suggestion to recur to his mind with dangerous frequency. He was getting familiar with what had at first startled and shocked him. But it was not at once that he brought his mind to the point. He was not possessed of much courage and could not help fearing that he would get himself into a scrape. It needed a little more urging on the part of Ralph. "'Well, Roswell,' said Ralph, a few evenings after the conversation recorded in the last chapter, "'when are you going to take me to the theater? "'I didn't know I was going to take you at all,' said Roswell. "'Come, there's no use in crawling off that way. "'Didn't I take you to Niblo's last week?' "'Yes, and didn't you promise to take me some night in return?' "'I should like to do it well enough,' said Roswell, "'but I never have any money. "'You might have some if you chose. "'The way you mentioned? "'Yes.' I don't like to try it. Then you are foolish. It's what half the clerks do. They have to. Do you think many do it? said Roswell irresolutely. To be sure they do, said Ralph confidently. But I am sure I would be found out. Not if you're careful. I shouldn't know how to go about it. Then I'll tell you. You're in the store alone some of the time, I suppose. Yes, when Mr. Baker and Mr. Jones are gone to dinner. Where's the money kept? There are two drawers. The one that has the most money in it is kept locked and Mr. Baker carries away the key with him. He leaves a few dollars in another drawer, but nothing could be taken from that drawer without being missed. Does he keep much money in the first drawer? I expect so. Then, said Ralph promptly, you must manage to get into that. But how am I to do it? asked Roswell. Didn't I tell you that it was kept locked and that Mr. Baker took the key? I can't say you are very smart, Roswell, said Ralph, a little contemptuously. Tell me what you mean, then. What is easier than to get a key made that will fit the drawer? All you have to do is to take an impression of the lock with sealing wax and carry it to a locksmith. He'll make you a key for two shillings. I don't know, said Roswell undecidedly. I don't quite like to do it. Do just as you please, said Ralph. Only if I carry you to the theater, I expect you to return the compliment. Well, I'll think of it, said Roswell. There is another way you can do, suggested Ralph, who was full of evil suggestions, and was perhaps the most dangerous counselor that Roswell could have had at this time. What is it? If you make any sales while you are alone, you might forget to put the money into the drawer. Yes, I might do that. And ten to one Baker would never suspect. Of course, he doesn't know every book he has in his store, or the exact amount of stationery he keeps on hand. No, I suppose not. You might begin that way. There couldn't be any danger of detection. This suggestion struck Roswell more favorably than the first, as it seemed safer. Without giving any decided answer, he suffered the thought to sink in his mind and occupy his thoughts. The next day, when about the middle of the day, Roswell found himself alone, a customer came in and bought a package of envelopes, paying 25 cents. With a half-guilty feeling, Roswell put this sum into his pocket. Mr. Baker will never miss a package of envelopes, he thought. He sold two or three other articles, but the money received for these he put into the drawer. He did not dare to take too much at first. Indeed, he took a little credit to himself, so strangely had his ideas of honesty got warped, for not taking more when he might have done so as well as not. Mr. Baker returned and nothing was said. As might have been expected, he did not miss the small sum which Roswell had appropriated. That evening, Roswell bought a couple of cigars with the money he had stolen, we might as well call things by their right names, and treated Ralph to one. There's a splendid play at Wallach's, said he suggestively. 
"'Perhaps we'll go tomorrow evening,' said Roswell. "'That's the way to talk,' said Ralph, looking keenly at Roswell. "'Is there anything new with you?' "'Not particularly,' said Roswell, coloring a little, "'for he did not care to own what he had done to his companion, "'though it was from him that he had received the advice. "'The next day, when Roswell was alone again, a lady entered the shop. "'Have you got La Fontaine's fables in English?' she asked. "'I have asked at half a dozen stores, but I can't find it. "'I'm afraid it is out of print.' "'Yes, I believe we have it,' said Roswell. "'He remembered one day when he was looking for a book he wanted to read.' that he had come across a shop-worn copy of La Fontaine's Fables. It was on a back shelf in an out-of-the-way place. He looked for it and found his memory had served him correctly. "'Here it is,' he said, handing it down. "'I'm very glad to get it,' said the lady. "'How much will it be?' "'The regular price is a dollar and a quarter, "'but as this is a little shop-worn, you may have it for a dollar. "'Very well.' The lady drew out a dollar bill from her purse and handed it to Roswell. He held it in his hand till she was fairly out of the door. Then the thought came into his mind. Why should I not keep this money? Mr. Baker would never know. Probably he has quite forgotten that such a book was in his stock. Besides, as the price of a ticket to the family circle at Wallach's was only thirty cents, this sum would carry in him and his friend, and there would be enough left for an ice cream after they had got through. The temptation was too much for poor Roswell. I call him poor because I pity any boy who foolishly yields to such a temptation for the sake of a temporary gratification. Roswell put the money into his vest pocket, and shortly afterwards Mr. Baker returned to the store. "'Have you sold anything, Roswell?' he inquired on entering. "'Yes, sir. I have sold a slate, a choir of note paper, and one of Oliver Optic's books.' Roswell showed Mr. Baker the slate, on which, as required by his employer, he had kept a record of sales. Mr. Baker made no remark, but appeared to think all was right. So the afternoon passed away without any incident worthy of mention. In the evening, Roswell met Ralph Graham, as he had got into the habit of doing. "'Well, Roswell, I feel just like going to the theatre tonight,' were his first words of salutation. "'Well, we'll go,' said Roswell. "'Good. You've got money to buy the tickets, then?' "'Yes,' said Roswell, with an air of importance. "'What's the play?' "'It's a London play that's had a great run. Tom Hastings tells me it's splendid. You take me there tonight, and I'll take you to the New York Circus some evening next week.' This arrangement was very satisfactory to Roswell, who had never visited the circus and had a great desire to do so. At an early hour, the boys went to the theater and succeeded in obtaining front seats in the family circle. Roswell managed to enjoy the play, although unpleasant thoughts of how the money was obtained by which the tickets were procured would occasionally intrude upon him. But the fascination of the stage kept them from troubling him much. When the performance was over, he suggested an ice cream. "'With all my heart,' said Ralph, I feel warm and thirsty, and an ice cream will cool my throat. So they adjourned to a confectionery establishment nearly opposite, and Roswell, with an air of importance, called for the creams. They sat leisurely over them, and it was nearly half past eleven when Roswell got home. What keeps you out so late, Roswell? asked his mother anxiously, for she was still up. I was at the theater, said Roswell. Where did you get the money? It's only thirty cents to the family circle, said Roswell carelessly. I'm tired, and will go right up to bed. So he closed the discussion, not caring to answer many inquiries as to his evening's amusement. His outlay for tickets and for the ice cream afterwards had just used up the money he had stolen, and all that he had to compensate for the loss of his integrity was a headache, occasioned by late hours and the warm and confined atmosphere at the theater. End of section 9 of Mark the Matchboy, or Richard Hunter's Ward, by Horatio Alger, Jr. Recording by Tori Falder. Section 10 of Mark the Matchboy, or Richard Hunter's Ward, by Horatio Alger, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Matchboy, or Richard Hunter's Ward, by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 19. Richard Hunter is Promoted. It was with eager impatience that Mark awaited the return of Richard Hunter to communicate to him his good luck in securing a place. The thought that he had secured it by his own exertions gave him great satisfaction. "'I've got a place!' were his first words as Richard entered the house. "'Already?' asked Richard Hunter. "'You have been quite smart, Mark. How did you manage to obtain it?' Mark gave the particulars, which need not be repeated. "'What kind of a store is it?' 
A bookstore. What is the name of your employer? Baker. Baker's bookstore, repeated Richard, turning to Fosdick. That is where our particular friend Roswell Crawford is employed. Yes, said Mark. There's a boy there about 16 or 17. I believe that is his name. I am not sure whether his being there will make it pleasant to you. Does he know that you are a friend of mine? Yes, said Mark. He inquired particularly about you, Mr. Hunter. He's very fond of me, said Dick. I suppose he sent me his love. No, said Mark, smiling. He didn't speak as if he loved you very much. He doesn't like me very much. I am afraid when he gets to be president, I shan't stand much chance of an office. He didn't try to bully you, did he? He said he could get me sent off if I wasn't careful to please him. That sounds like Roswell. He talked as if he was the one of the firm, said Mark, but when Mr. Baker came in, he began to scold him for not dusting the books. After that, I didn't think so much of what he said. It's a way he has, said Fosdick. He don't like me much either, as I got a place that he was trying for. If he bullies you, just let me know, said Richard. Perhaps I can stop it. I am not afraid, said Mark. Mr. Baker is there most of the time, and he wouldn't dare to bully me before him. Sunday morning came, a day when the noisy streets were hushed and the hum of business was stilled. Richard Hunter and Fosdick still attended the Sunday school to which they had now belonged for over two years. They were still members of Mr. Grayson's class and were much better informed in religious matters than formerly. Frequently, for they were favorite scholars with Mr. Grayson, he invited them home to dine at his handsome residence. Both boys were now perfectly self-possessed on such occasions. They knew how to behave at the table with perfect decorum, and no one would have judged from their dress, manners, or conversation that they had not always been accustomed to the same style of living. Mr. and Mrs. Grayson noticed with pleasure the great improvement in their protégés, and always welcomed them with kind hospitality. But there was another member of the family who always looked forward with pleasure to seeing them. This was Ida, now a young lady of thirteen, who had from the first taken an especial fancy to Dick, as she always called him. "'Well, Mark,' said Richard Hunter on Sunday morning, "'wouldn't you like to go to Sunday school with me?' "'Yes,' said Mark. "'Mother always wanted me to go to Sunday school, "'but she was so poor that she could not dress me in suitable clothes. "'There is nothing to prevent your going now. "'We shall be ready in about half an hour.' At the appointed time the three set out. The distance was not great, the church being situated four blocks farther uptown on Fifth Avenue. They chanced to meet Mr. Grayson on the church steps. "'Good morning, Richard. Good morning, Henry,' he said, then glancing at Mark. "'Who is your young friend?' "'His name is Mark Manton,' said Richard. "'He is my ward.' "'Indeed! I had not thought of you in the character of a guardian,' said Mr. Grayson, smiling. "'I should like to have him enter one of the younger classes,' said Richard. "'Certainly. I will gladly find a place for him. Perhaps you can take him in your class.' "'In my class?' repeated Richard in surprise. Yes, I thought I had mentioned to you that Mr. Benton was about to leave the city and is obliged to give up his class. I would like to have you take it. But am I qualified to be a teacher? asked Richard, who had never before thought of being invited to take a class. I think you have excellent qualifications for such a position. It speaks well for you, however, that you should feel a modest hesitation on the subject. I think Fosdick would make a better teacher than I am. Oh, I intend to draft him into the service also. I shall ask him to take the next vacancy. The class assigned to our friend Dick, we are sometimes tempted to call him by his old familiar name, consisted of boys from 10 to 11 years of age. Among these, Mark was placed. Although he had never before attended a Sunday school, his mother, who was an excellent woman, had given him considerable religious instruction, so that he was about as well advanced as the rest of the class. Richard easily adapted himself to the new situation in which he was placed. He illustrated the lesson in a familiar and oftentimes quaint manner, so that he easily commanded the attention of the boys, who were surprised when the time came for the lesson to close. "'I am glad you are my teacher, Mr. Hunter,' said one of the boys at the close of the service. "'Thank you,' said Richard, who felt gratified at the compliment. "'It's new business to me, but I hope I shall be able to interest you.' "'Won't you come and dine with us?' asked Mr. Grayson, as they were leaving the church. Richard Hunter hesitated. "'I don't know if Mark can find his way home,' he said with hesitation. "'Yes, I can, Mr. Hunter,' said Mark. "'Don't trouble yourself about me.' "'But I mean to have him come, too,' said Mr. Grayson. "'Our table is a large one, as you know, and we can accommodate three as well as two. "'Do come, Dick,' said Ida Grayson. Richard was seldom able to resist a request preferred by Ida, and surrendered at discretion.' So, as usual, Fosdick walked on with Mr. Grayson, this time with Mark beside him, while Richard walked with Ida. 
"'Who is that little boy, Dick?' asked the young lady. "'That's my ward, Miss Ida,' said Richard. "'You don't mean to say you are his guardian, Dick?' "'Yes, I believe I am.' "'Why,' said the lively young lady, "'I always thought guardians were old and cross and bald-headed.' "'I don't know, but that description will suit me after a while,' said Dick. "'My hair has been coming out lately.' "'Has it really?' said Ida, who took this seriously. "'I hope you won't be bald. I don't think you would look well.' "'But I might wear a wig.' "'I don't like wigs,' said the young lady decidedly. "'If you were a lady now, you might wear a cap. "'How funny you'd look in a cap!' "'And she burst out into a peal of merry laughter. "'I think a cap would be more becoming to you,' said Richard. "'Do you ever scold your ward?' asked Ida. "'No, he's a pretty good boy. He don't need it. "'Where did you get acquainted with him? "'Have you known him long?' "'He was taken sick at the door of our office one day, "'so I had him carried to my boarding place "'and took care of him till he got well.' "'That was very good of you,' said Ida approvingly. "'What did he use to do?' "'He was a match boy. "'Does he sell matches now?' "'No, he has got a place in a bookstore. "'What did you say his name was?' "'Mark. "'That's a pretty good name, "'but I don't like it so well as Dick.' "'Thank you,' said Richard. "'I am glad you like my name.' "'At this moment they were passing the Fifth Avenue Hotel. "'Standing on the steps were two acquaintances of ours, "'Roswell Crawford and Ralph Graham.' They had cigars in their mouths, and there was a swaggering air about them, which was not likely to prepossess any sensible person in their favor. They had not been to church, but had spent the morning in sauntering about the city, finally bringing up at the Fifth Avenue Hotel, where, posting themselves conspicuously on the steps, they watched the people passing by on their way from church. Richard Hunter bowed to Roswell, as it was his rule never to be found wanting in politeness. Roswell was ill-mannered enough not to return the salutation. "'Who is that, Roswell?' asked Ralph Graham. "'It's a boot black,' said Roswell sneeringly. "'What do you mean? I am speaking of that nice-looking young fellow that bowed to you just now. "'His name is Hunter. He used to be a boot black, as I told you. "'But he's got up in the world, and now he's putting on airs. "'He seems to have got into good company at any rate. "'He's walking with the daughter of Mr. Grayson, a rich merchant downtown.' "'He's got impudence enough for anything,' said Roswell, "'with a feeling of bitter envy which he could not conceal.' It really makes me sick to see him strutting about as if he were a gentleman's son. Like you, suggested Ralph slyly, for he had already been informed by Roswell on various occasions that he was a gentleman's son. Yes, said Roswell, I'm a gentleman's son, if I'm not so lucky as some people. Did you see that small boy in front, walking with Mr. Grayson? Yes, I suppose so. What of him? That's our errand boy. Is it? asked Ralph in some surprise. He seems to be one of the lucky kind, too. He sold matches about the streets till a few weeks ago, said Roswell spitefully. He sold them to some purpose, it seems, for he's evidently going home to dine with Mr. Grayson. Mr. Grayson seems to be very fond of low company. That's all I can say. When you and I get to be as rich as he is, we can choose our own company. I hope I shall choose better than he. "'Well, let's drop them,' said Ralph, who was getting tired of the subject. "'I must be getting home to dinner. So must I. "'Come round to my room after dinner, and we'll have another smoke. "'Yes, I'll come round. I suppose Mother will be wanting me to go to church with her, "'but I've got tired of going to church.'" Chapter 20. The Madison Club Two days afterwards, when Roswell, as usual, met his friend Ralph, the latter said, with an air of importance, "'I've got news for you, Roswell.' "'What is it?' inquired Roswell. "'You have been unanimously elected a member of our club.' "'Your club?' "'Yes. Didn't I ever mention it to you?' "'No.' "'Well, I believe I didn't. "'You see, I intended to propose your name as a member, "'and not feeling certain whether you would be elected, "'I thought I'd better not mention it to you.' "'What is the name of the club?' asked Roswell eagerly. "'The Madison Club. "'What made you call it that?' "'Why, you see, there's one fellow in the club "'that lives on Madison Avenue, "'and we thought that would be an aristocratic name, "'so we chose it.' Roswell liked whatever was aristocratic, and the name pleased him. "'Did you say I was unanimously elected, Ralph?' he asked. "'Yes. I proposed your name at our meeting last night. It was on account of that that I couldn't meet you as usual. But hereafter we can go together to the meetings. "'How many fellows belong? Twenty. We don't mean to have more than twenty-five. We are quite particular whom we elect.' "'Of course,' said Roswell, in a tone of importance. "'You wouldn't want a set of low fellows like that Dick Hunter.' "'No.' "'By the way, I've got somewhere your notification from the secretary. "'Here it is.' "'He drew from his pocket a note adorned with a large and elaborate seal, "'which Roswell opening found read as follows. "'Madison Club, Mr. Roswell Crawford.' 
Sir, I have the honor of informing you that at the last regular meeting of the Madison Club, you were unanimously elected a member. Yours respectfully, James Tracy. This document Roswell read with much satisfaction. It sounded well to say that he was a member of the Madison Club, and his unanimous election could only be regarded as a high compliment. I will join, he said pompously. When is the next meeting? Next Tuesday evening. Where does the society meet? In a room on 4th Avenue. You can come round early and we will go together. All right. What do you do at the meetings? Well, we smoke and tell stories and have a good time. Generally, there are some eatables provided. However, you'll know all about it when you join. Oh, by the way, there's one thing I forgot to tell you, added Ralph. There's an initiation fee of five dollars. A fee of five dollars, repeated Roswell soberly. Yes. What's it for? To defray expenses, of course. There's the rent and lights and stationery and the eatables. They always, I think, have an initiation fee at clubs. Are there any other expenses? Not much. There's only a dollar a month. That isn't much. I don't know how I'm going to raise the five dollars, said Roswell soberly. I could manage the dollar a month afterwards. Oh, you'll think of some way, said Ralph. My mother wouldn't give it to me, so there's no use asking her. Why can't you pay it out of your extra wages, said Ralph significantly. I shouldn't dare to take such a large sum, said Roswell. They would find me out. Not if you're careful. They don't keep but a few dollars in the drawer at one time. But didn't you tell me there was another drawer? Yes, but that is always kept locked. Open it, then. I have no key. Get one that will fit it, then. I don't like to do that. Well, it's nothing to me, said Ralph, only I should like to have you belong to the club, and you can't unless you're able to pay the initiation fee. I would like very much to belong, said Roswell irresolutely. I know you would enjoy it. We have splendid times. I'll see what I can do to raise the money, said Roswell. That's the way to talk. You'll manage to get it some way. It was a great temptation to Roswell. The more he thought of it, the more he thought he should like to say that he was a member of the Madison Club. He had a weak love of gentility and he was persuaded that it would improve his social standing, but he did not wish to adopt the course recommended by Ralph if there was any other way of getting the money. He determined, therefore, first to make the effort to obtain the money from his mother on some pretext or other. By the time he reached home, which was at an earlier hour than usual, he had arranged his pretext. "'I'm glad you're home early,' said Mrs. Crawford. "'Yes, I thought I'd come home early tonight. Mother, I wish you'd let me have four dollars.' What for, Roswell? I want to buy a new hat. This one is getting shabby. Roswell's plan was, if he could obtain the four dollars from his mother, to make up the extra dollar out of sales unaccounted for. As to the failure to buy the hat, he could tell his mother that he had lost the money, or make some other excuse. That thought did not trouble him much, but he was not destined to succeed. I'm sorry you are dissatisfied with your hat, Roswell, said Mrs. Crawford, for I cannot possibly spare you the money now. So you always say, grumbled Roswell. But it's true, said his mother. I'm very short just now. The rent comes due in a few days, and I'm trying hard to get together money enough to pay it. I thought you had money coming in from your lodgers. There's Mr. Bancroft hasn't paid me for six weeks, and I'm afraid I'm going to lose his room rent. It's hard work for a woman to get along. Everybody takes advantage of her, said Mrs. Crawford, sighing. Can't you possibly let me have the money by Saturday, mother? No, Roswell. Perhaps in a few weeks I can, but I don't think your hat looks bad. You can go and get it pressed if you wish. But Roswell declared that wouldn't do, and left the room in an ill humor. Instead of feeling for his mother and wishing to help her, he was intent only upon his own selfish gratifications. So much, then, was plain. In his efforts to raise the money for the initiation fee at the club, he could not expect any help from his mother. He must rely upon other means. Gradually, Roswell came to the determination to follow the dangerous advice which had been proffered him by Ralph Graham. He could not bear to give up the project of belonging to the club, and was willing to commit a dishonest act rather than forego the opportunity. He began to think now of the manner in which he could accomplish what he had in view. The next day, when noon came, he went round to the locked drawer, and lighting a piece of sealing wax, which he had taken from one of the cases, he obtained a clear impression of the lock. I think that will do, thought Roswell. At that moment, a customer entered the store, and he hurried the stick of sealing wax into his pocket. When the store closed, Roswell went round to a locksmith, whose sign he remembered to have seen in Third Avenue. He entered the shop with a guilty feeling at his heart, though he had a plausible story arranged for the occasion. 
I want a key made, he said in a business-like manner, one that will fit this lock. Here he displayed the wax impression. What sort of a lock is it? asked the locksmith, looking at it. It is a bureau drawer, said Roswell. We have lost the key and can't open it, so I took the impression in wax. How soon can you let me have it? Are you in a hurry for it? Yes. Didn't I tell you we couldn't open the drawer? Well, I'll try to let you have it by tomorrow night. That will do, said Roswell. He left the locksmith's shop with mixed feelings of satisfaction and shame at the thought of the use to which he was intending to put the key. It was a great price he had determined to pay for the honor of belonging to the Madison Club. End of section 10 of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Recording by Tori Falder. Section 11 of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 21. Roswell Joins the Madison Club. It was not until Saturday night that Roswell obtained the key. The locksmith, like tradesmen and mechanics in general, kept putting him off, to Roswell's great annoyance. As he did not get the key till Saturday night, of course there would be no opportunity of using it till Monday. The only time then was the hour in which Mr. Baker and Mr. Jones were absent, and Roswell was left alone. But to his great vexation, an old gentleman came in directly after Mr. Baker went out and inquired for him. "'He's gone to dinner,' said Roswell." "'I think I'll wait till he returns,' said the visitor, coolly sitting down in Mr. Baker's armchair. Roswell was in dismay, for this would, of course, prevent his using the key which he had taken so much trouble to obtain. "'Mr. Baker is always out a good while,' said Roswell. "'Never mind, I can wait for him. I came in from the country this morning, and shall not need to start back till four. "'Perhaps,' suggested Roswell, "'you could go out and do the rest of your errands and come back at two o'clock. Mr. Baker will be sure to be back then.' "'Who told you I had any more errands to do?' asked the old gentleman sharply. "'I thought you might have,' said Roswell, somewhat confused. "'You are very considerate, but as my business is over for the day, "'I will ask your permission to remain till my nephew returns.' "'So this was Mr. Baker's uncle, a shrewd old gentleman, if he did live in the country.' "'Certainly,' said Roswell, but not with very good grace, adding to himself, "'There will be no chance for me to get the money today. "'I hope the old fellow won't come round again tomorrow.' The next day was Tuesday. In the evening the club was to meet, so there was no time to lose. Fortunately, as Roswell thought, the coast was clear. Suppose the key won't fit, he thought with uneasiness. It would have been lucky for Roswell if the key had not fitted, but it proved to fit exactly. Turning it in the lock, the drawer opened, and before him lay a pile of bills. How much or how little there might be, Roswell did not stop to examine. He knew that a customer might come in at any time, and he must do at once what he meant to do. At the top of the pile there was a five-dollar bill. He took it, slipped it hastily into his vest pocket, relocked the drawer, and walking away from it began to dust the books upon the counter. He felt that he had taken the decisive step. He was supplied with the necessary money to pay the initiation fee. The question was, would Mr. Baker find it out? Suppose he should. How would it be possible to evade suspicion, or to throw it upon someone else? If I could make him think it was the match boy, thought Roswell, I should be killing two birds with one stone. I must see what can be done. When Mr. Baker returned, Roswell feared he would go to the drawer, but he did not seem inclined to do this. He just entered the store and said, Mr. Jones, I am obliged to go over to Brooklyn on a little business, and I may not be back this afternoon. Very well, sir, said Mr. Jones. Roswell breathed freer after he had left the shop. It had occurred to him as possible that if the money were missed, he might be searched, in which case the key and the bill in his pocket would be enough to convict him. Now he should not see Mr. Baker again until the next day, probably, when the money would be disposed of. Mr. Baker, as he anticipated, did not return from Brooklyn before Roswell left the store. Roswell snatched a hasty supper and went over to his friend Ralph Graham's room immediately afterwards. "'Glad to see you, Roswell,' said Ralph. "'Are you coming to the club with me tonight?' Yes, said Roswell. Have you got the five dollars? Yes. How did you manage it? Oh, I contrived to get it, said Roswell, who did not like to confess in what way he had secured the possession of the money. Well, it's all right as long as you've got it. I was afraid you wouldn't succeed. So was I, said Roswell. I had hard work of it. What time do the club meetings begin, he asked. 
at eight o'clock, but I generally go round about half an hour before. Generally, some of the fellows are there, and we can have a social chat. I guess we'll go round at half past seven, and that will give me a chance to introduce you to some of the members before the meeting begins. I should like that, said Roswell. In a short time, the boys set out. They paused before a small house on Fourth Avenue and rang the bell. The summons was answered by a colored man. Any members of the club upstairs? inquired Ralph. Yes, sir, said the attendant. There's Mr. Tracy, Mr. Wilmot, and Mr. Burgess. Very well, I'll go up. Jackson, said Ralph, this gentleman is Mr. Crawford, a new member. Glad to make your acquaintance, sir, said Jackson. Thank you, said Roswell. Jackson takes care of the club room, explained Ralph, and is in attendance to admit the members on club nights. Now let us go upstairs. They went up one flight of stairs and opened the door of a back room. It was not a very imposing-looking apartment, being only about twenty feet square, the floor covered with a faded carpet, while the furniture was not particularly sumptuous. At one end of the room was a table, behind which were two armchairs. That is where the president and secretary sit, said Ralph. There were already three or four youths in the room. One of them came forward and offered his hand to Ralph. How are you, Graham? he said. How are you, Tracy? returned Ralph. This is Mr. Crawford, who was elected a member at our last meeting. Roswell, this is Mr. Tracy, our secretary. I am glad to see you, Mr. Crawford, said Tracy. I hope you received the notification of your election which I sent you. Yes, said Roswell. I am much obliged to you. I hope you intend to accept. It will give me great pleasure, said Roswell. You must have very pleasant meetings. I hope you will find them pleasant. By the way, here is our president, Mr. Brandon. Brandon, let me introduce you to a new member of our society, Mr. Crawford. The president, who was a tall young man of eighteen, bowed graciously to Roswell. Mr. Crawford, said he, allow me, in the name of the society, to bid you welcome to our gay and festive meetings. We are a band of good fellows who like to meet together and have a social time. We're proud to receive you into our ranks. And I am very glad to belong, said Roswell, who felt highly pleased at the cordial manner in which he was received. You'd better go to the secretary and enter your name in the books of the club, suggested Ralph. You can pay him the five dollars at the same time. Here, Tracy, Mr. Crawford wants to enroll his name. All right, said Tracy. Walk this way if you please, Mr. Crawford. Roswell wrote down his name, residence, and the store where he was employed. I see, Mr. Crawford, you are engaged in literary pursuits, said the secretary. Yes, for the present, said Roswell. I don't think I shall remain long, as the book business doesn't give me scope enough. But I shall not leave at present, as it might inconvenience Mr. Baker. What is your initiation fee? Five dollars. I happen to have the money with me, I believe, said Roswell. Here it is. Thank you. That is right. I will enter you as paid. The monthly assessments are one dollar, as perhaps Graham told you. Yes, I think he mentioned it. It is quite reasonable, I think, said Roswell, in a tone which seemed to indicate that he was never at a loss for money. Yes, I think so, considering our expenses. You see, we have to pay for the room, then we pay Jackson's wages, and there are cigars, etc., for the use of the members. Have you ever before belonged to a club? No, said Roswell. I have always declined hitherto. He had never before received an invitation. But I was so much pleased with what I heard of the Madison Club from my friend Graham that I determined to join. I am glad that you are particular whom you admit as members of the club. Oh, yes, we are very exclusive, said Tracy. We are not willing to admit anybody and everybody. Meanwhile, there have been numerous arrivals, until probably nearly all the members of the club were present. Order, gentlemen, said the president, assuming the chair and striking the table at the same time. The club will please come to order. There was a momentary confusion, but at length the members settled into their seats and silence prevailed. Roswell Crawford took a seat beside Ralph Graham. Chapter 22 a club night. The secretary will read the journal of the last meeting, said President Brandon. Tracy rose and read a brief report, which was accepted according to form. Is there any business to come before the club, inquired the president. I would like to nominate a friend of mine as a member of the club, said Burgess. What's his name, inquired a member. Henry Drayton. Will Mr. Burgess give some account of his friend so that the members can vote intelligently on his election, requested Brandon. He's a jolly sort of fellow and a good singer, said Burgess. He'll help make our meetings lively. He's about my age. In his second childhood, suggested Wilmot. This produced a laugh at the expense of Burgess, who took it good-naturedly. Has he got five dollars? inquired another member. His father is a rich man, said Burgess. There will be no fear about his not paying his assessments. That's the principal thing, said Wilmot. I second the nomination. A vote was taken, which was unanimously affirmative. 
Mr. Drayton is unanimously elected a member of the Madison Club, announced the president. Notification will be duly sent him by the secretary. Is there any other business to come before the club? As there appeared to be none, Brandon added, then we will proceed to the more agreeable duties which have brought us hither. He rang a small bell. Jackson answered the summons. Jackson, is the punch ready? inquired the president. Yes, sir, said Jackson. Then bring it in. I appoint Wilmot and Burgess to lend you the necessary aid. A large flagon of hot whiskey punch was brought in and placed on a table. Glasses were produced from a closet in the corner of the room, and it was served out to the members. How do you like it, Roswell? inquired Ralph Graham. It's <coughs> rather strong, said Roswell, coughing. Oh, you'll soon be used to it. The fellows will begin to be jolly after they've drunk a glass or two. Do they ever get tight? whispered Roswell. A little lively, that's all. The effect predicted soon followed. Wilmot, give us a song, said Burgess. What will you have, said Wilmot, whose flushed face showed that the punch had begun to affect him. Oh, you can give us an air from one of the operas. Villikins and his Dinah, suggested Tracy. Very good, said Wilmot. Wilmot was one of those who, with no voice or musical ear, are under the delusion that they are admirable singers. He executed the song in his usual style and was rewarded with vociferous applause, which appeared to gratify him. Gentlemen, he said, laying his hand upon his heart, I am deeply grateful for your kind appreciation of my admirable singing, suggested Dunbar. Of my admirable singing, repeated Wilmot gravely. This speech was naturally followed by an outburst of laughter. Wilmot looked around him in grave surprise. I don't see what you fellows are laughing at, he said, unless you're all drunk. He sat down amid a round of applause, evidently puzzled to understand the effect of his words. After this, David Green arose and rehearsed amid great applause a stump speech which he had heard at some minstrel entertainment which he had attended. How do you like it, Roswell? again inquired Ralph Graham. It's splendid, said Roswell enthusiastically. Are you glad you joined? Yes, I wouldn't have missed it for a good deal. I knew you'd say so. Have your glass filled. Here, Jackson, fill this gentleman's glass. Roswell was beginning to feel a little light-headed, but the punch had excited him, and he had become in a degree reckless of consequences. So he made no opposition to the proposal, but held out his glass, which was soon returned to him, filled to the brim. "'Speech from the new member!' called Dunbar after a while. "'Yes, speech, speech!' All eyes were turned toward Roswell. "'You'd better say something,' said Ralph. Roswell rose to his feet, but found it necessary to hold on to his chair for support. Mr. President, commenced Roswell, gazing about him in a vacant way, this is a great occasion. Of course it is, said Burgess. We are assembled tonight. So we are, bright boy, said David Green. I am a gentleman's son, continued Roswell. What's the gentleman's name, interrupted Wilmot. And I think it's a shame that I should only be paid six dollars a week for my services. Bring your employer here and we'll lynch him, said Tracy. Such mean treatment of a member of the Madison Club should meet with the severest punishment. Go ahead. I don't think I've got anything more to say, said Roswell. As my head doesn't feel just right, I'll sit down. There was a round of applause and Wilmot arose. Mr. President, he said gravely, I have been very much impressed with the remarks of the gentleman who has just sat down. They do equal credit to his head and his heart. His reference to his salary was most touching. If you will allow me, I will pause a moment and wipe away an unbidden tear. Here, amid laughter and applause, Wilmot made an imposing demonstration with a large handkerchief. He then proceeded. Excuse my emotion, gentlemen. I merely arose to make the motion that the gentleman should furnish us a copy of his remarks, that they may be engrossed on parchment, and a copy sent to the principal libraries in Europe and America. Roswell was hardly in a condition to understand that fun was being made of him but listened soberly, sipping from time to time from his glass. The motion is not in order, said Brandon. The hour for business has gone by. The punch was now removed and cards were produced. The remainder of the evening was spent in playing euchre and other games. Roswell took a hand but found he was too dizzy to play correctly and for the remainder of the evening contented himself with looking on. Small sums were staked among some of the players and thus a taste for gambling was fostered which might hereafter lead to moral shipwreck and ruin. This was the way in which the members of the Madison Club spent their evenings, a very poor way, as my young readers will readily acknowledge. I heartily approve of societies organized by young people for debate and mutual improvement. They are oftentimes productive of great good. 
Some of our distinguished men date their first impulse to improve and advance themselves to their connection with such a society. But the Madison Club had no salutary object in view. It was adapted to inspire a taste for gambling and drinking, and the money spent by the members to sustain it was worse than wasted. Roswell, however, who would have found nothing to interest or attract him in a debating society, was very favorably impressed by what he had seen of the Madison Club. He got an erroneous impression that it was likely to introduce him into the society of gentlemen, and his aristocratic predilections were, as we know, one of Roswell's hobbies. It was about eleven when the club broke up its meeting. Previous to this there was a personal difficulty between Wilmot and Tracy, which resulted in a rough-and-tumble fight in which Wilmot got the worst of it. How the quarrel arose no one could remember, the principals least of all. At last they were reconciled and were persuaded to shake hands. They issued into the street a noisy throng. Roswell's head ached, the punch to which he was not accustomed, having affected him in this way. Besides this he felt a little dizzy. "'I wish you'd come home with me, Ralph,' he said to his friend. "'I don't feel quite right.' "'Oh, you'll feel all right tomorrow. "'Your head will become as strong as mine after a while. "'I'm as cool as a cucumber.' "'It's rather late, isn't it?' asked Roswell. "'Hark, there's the clock striking. "'I'll count the strokes. Eleven o'clock,' he said after counting. "'That isn't very late.' "'Ralph accompanied Roswell to the door of his mother's house in Clinton Place. "'Good night, old fellow,' he said. "'You'll be all right in the morning.' "'Good night,' said Roswell.' He crept up to bed, but his brain was excited by the punch he had drank, and it was only after tossing about for two hours that he at length sank into a troubled sleep. End of section 11 of Mark the Matchboy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Recording by Tori Falder. Section 12 of Mark the Matchboy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 23. Who was the thief? When Roswell rose the next morning, he felt cross and out of sorts. His head still ached a little, and he wished he were not obliged to go to the store but it was out of the question to remain at home, so he started about half an hour after the usual time, and of course arrived late. "'You are late this morning,' said Mr. Baker. "'You must be more particular about being here in good season.' Roswell muttered something about not feeling quite well. Putting his hand into his pocket by chance, his fingers came in contact with the key which he had made to open the cash drawer. Just as he was passing Mark, he drew it out and let it drop into the side pocket of his jacket. So, if suspicion were excited, the key would be found on Mark, not on him. The critical moment came sooner than he had anticipated. A Mr. Gay, one of the regular customers of the bookstore, entered a few minutes later. "'Good morning, Mr. Baker,' he said. "'Have you got a tribune this morning?' "'Yes, here is one. By the way, you are just the man I wanted to see. Indeed, I feel complimented. Wait till you hear what I'm going to say. You bought a copy of Corinne here on Monday.' "'Yes.' and handed me a five-dollar bill on the park bank? Yes. Well, I find the bill was a skillfully executed counterfeit. Indeed! I didn't examine it very closely, but I know where I took it, and will give you a good bill in exchange for it. I locked it up, lest it should get out, said Mr. Baker. He went to the drawer which Roswell had opened. Roswell listened to this conversation with dismay. He realized that he was in a tight place, for it was undoubtedly the five-dollar counterfeit which he had taken, and paid to the secretary of the Madison Club. He awaited nervously the result of Mr. Baker's examination. "'Don't you find it?' asked Mr. Gay. "'It is very strange,' said Mr. Baker. "'I placed it at the top of a pile of bills, and now it is gone.' "'Look through the pile. Perhaps your memory is at fault,' said Mr. Gay. Mr. Baker did so. "'No,' he said. "'The bill has disappeared. "'Do you miss anything else?' "'No. The money is just five dollars short.' Perhaps you forget yourself and paid it away to a customer. Impossible. I always make change out of this drawer. Well, when you find it, I will make it right. I am in a hurry this morning. Mr. Gay went out. Has anyone been to this drawer? inquired Mr. Baker abruptly. You always keep it locked, do you not? said Mr. Jones. And keep the key myself, yes. Then I don't see how it could have been opened. There was nothing peculiar about the lock. There might easily be another key to fit it. I hope you don't suspect me, Mr. Baker. No, Mr. Jones, you have been with me five years, and I have perfect confidence in you. 
Thank you, sir. I hope you don't suspect me, sir, said Roswell boldly. I am willing to turn my pockets inside out to show that I have no key that will fit the lock. Very well, you may do so. Roswell turned his pockets inside out, but of course no key was found. How lucky I got rid of it, he thought. Now it's your turn, Mark, he said. I'm perfectly willing, said Mark promptly. He put his hand into his pocket, and to his unutterable astonishment and dismay, drew out a key. I didn't know I had this in my pocket, he said startled. Hand me that key, said Mr. Baker sternly. Mark handed it to him mechanically. Mr. Baker went behind the counter and fitted the key in the lock. It proved to open the drawer with ease. Where did you get this key, he said. I didn't know I had it, sir, said Mark earnestly. I hope you will believe me. I don't understand how you can hope anything of the kind. It seems very clear that you have been at my drawer and taken the missing money. When did you take it? I have never opened the drawer nor taken your money, said Mark, in a firm voice, though his cheek was pale and his look was troubled. I am sorry to say that I do not believe you, said Mr. Baker coldly. Once more, when did you take the five dollars? I did not take it at all, sir. Have you lent the key to anyone? No, sir, I did not know I had it. I don't know what to do in the matter, said the bookseller, turning to Mr. Jones, his assistant. It seems clear to me that the boy took the missing bill. I'm afraid so, said Jones, who was a kind-hearted man and pitied Mark. But I don't know when he could have had the chance. He is never left alone in the store. Roswell, said Mr. Baker, have you left Mark alone in the store at any time within two or three days? Roswell saw the point of the inquiry and determined as a measure of safety to add falsehood to his former offense. Yes, sir, he said in an apologetic tone. I left him in the store for two or three minutes yesterday. Why did you leave him? Did you go out of the store? Yes, sir. A friend was passing and I went out to speak to him. I don't think I stayed more than two or three minutes. And Mark was left alone in the store. Yes, sir. I had no idea that any harm would come of it. Mark looked intently at Roswell when he uttered this falsehood. You had better confess, Mark, that you took the money when Roswell was out of the store, said his employer. If you make a full confession, I will be as lenient with you as I can, considering your youth. Mr. Baker, said Mark quietly, more at his ease now, since he began to understand that there was a plot against him. I cannot confess what is not true. I don't know what Roswell means by what he has just said, but I was not left alone in the store for a moment at all yesterday. Nor did Roswell go out to speak to a friend while I was about. There seems to be a conflict of evidence here, said Mr. Baker. I hope the word of a gentleman's son is worth more than that of a match boy, said Roswell haughtily. To whom do you refer when you speak of a match boy? To him, said Roswell, pointing to Mark. He used to be a vagabond boy about the streets selling matches and sleeping anywhere he could. No wonder he steals. I never stole in my life, said Mark indignantly. It is true that I sold matches about the streets, and I should have been doing it now if it had not been for my meeting with kind friends. As to this having been a match boy, that has no bearing upon the question, said Mr. Baker. It is the discovery of the key in his pocket that throws the gravest suspicion upon him. I must see his friends and inquire into the matter. Of course they will stand by him, said Roswell. We may get some light thrown upon his possession of the key at any rate, and can judge for ourselves. I shall keep you employed until this matter is investigated, said Mr. Baker to Mark. Here is a parcel of books to be carried to 27th Street. Come back as soon as they are delivered. Mark went out with a heavy heart, for it troubled him to think he was under suspicion. Theft, too, he had always despised. He wondered if Richard Hunter would believe him guilty. He could not bear to think that so kind a friend should think so ill of him. But Mark's vindication was not long in coming. He had been out scarcely ten minutes when Roswell, upon looking up, saw to his dismay Tracy, the secretary of the Madison Club, entering the store. His heart misgave him as to the nature of the business on which he had probably come. He went forward hastily to meet him. "'How are you, Crawford?' said Tracy. "'Pretty well. I'm very busy now. I will see you after the store closes. Anywhere you please.' Oh, said Tracy, in a voice loud enough for Mr. Baker to hear, it won't take a minute. The bill you gave me last night was a bad one. Of course, you didn't know it. Roswell turned red and pale and hoped Mr. Baker did not hear. But Mr. Baker had caught the words and came forward. Show me the bill, if you please, young gentleman, he said. I have a good reason for asking. Certainly, sir, said Tracy, rather surprised. Here it is. A moment's glance satisfied Mr. Baker that it was the missing bill. Did Roswell pay you this bill, he asked. Yes, sir. 
For what did he owe it? I am the secretary of the Madison Club, and this was paid as the entrance fee. I recognize the bill, said Mr. Baker. I will take it, if you please, and you can look to him for another. Very well, said Tracy, puzzled by the words, the motive of which he did not understand. Perhaps you will explain this, said Mr. Baker, turning to Roswell. It seems that you took this bill. Roswell's confidence deserted him, and he stood pale and downcast. The key, I presume, belonged to you? Yes, sir, he ejaculated with difficulty. And you dropped it into Mark's pocket, thus meanly trying to implicate him in a theft which you had yourself committed? Roswell was silent. Have you taken money before? I never opened the drawer but once. That was not my question. Make a full confession, and I will not have you arrested, but shall require you to make restitution of all the sums you have stolen. I shall not include this bill, as it is now returned to my possession. Here is a piece of paper. Write down the items. Roswell did so. They footed up a little over six dollars. Mr. Baker examined it. Is this all, he said? Yes, sir. Half a week's wages are due you. I will therefore deduct three dollars from this amount. The remainder I shall expect you to refund. I shall have no further occasion for your services. Roswell took his cap and was about to leave the store. Wait a few minutes. You have tried to implicate Mark in your theft. You must wait till his return and apologize to him for what you have attempted to do. Must I do this? asked Roswell ruefully. You must, said Mr. Baker firmly. When Mark came in and was told how he had been cleared of suspicion, he felt very happy. Roswell made the apology dictated to him with a very bad grace and was then permitted to leave the store. At home he tried to hide the circumstances attending his discharge from his mother and his cousin, but the necessity of refunding the money made that impossible. It was only a few days afterwards that Mrs. Crawford received a letter informing her of the death of a brother in Illinois, and that he had left her a small house and farm. She had found it so hard a struggle for the livelihood in the city that she decided to remove thither, greatly to Roswell's disgust, who did not wish to be immured in the country. But his wishes could not be gratified, and sulky and discontented, he was obliged to leave the choice society of the Madison Club and the attractions of New York for the quiet of a country town. Let us hope that away from the influences of the city his character may be improved and become more manly and self-reliant. It is only just to say that he was led to appropriate what did not belong to him by the desire to gratify his vanity and through the influence of a bad adviser. If he can ever forget that he is the son of a gentleman, I shall have some hopes for him. Chapter 24. An Excursion to Fort Hamilton Towards the close of May there was a general holiday, occasioned by the arrival of a distinguished stranger in the city. All the stores were to be closed. There was to be a turnout of the military and a long procession. Among those released from duty were our three friends, Fosdick, Richard Hunter, and his ward Mark. "'Well, Dick, what are you going to do tomorrow?' inquired Fosdick on the evening previous. I was expecting an invitation to ride in a barouche with the mayor, said Richard, but probably he forgot my address and couldn't send it. On the whole, I'm glad of it, being rather bashful and not used to popular enthusiasm. Shall you go out and see the procession, continued Fosdick. No, said Dick, I have been thinking of another plan, which I think will be pleasanter. What is it? It's a good while since we took an excursion. Suppose we go to Fort Hamilton tomorrow. I should like that, said Fosdick. I was never there. How do we get there? Cross over Fulton Ferry to Brooklyn, and there we might take the cars to Fort Hamilton. It's seven or eight miles out there. Why do you say might take the cars? Because the cars will be crowded with excursionists, and I have been thinking we might hire a carriage on the Brooklyn side and ride out there in style. It'll cost more money, but we don't often take a holiday, and we can afford it for once. What do you say, Mark? Do you mean me to go? asked Mark eagerly. Of course I do. Do you think your guardian would trust you to remain in the city alone? I go in for your plan, Dick, said Fosdick. What time do you want to start? About half past nine o'clock. That will give us plenty of time to go. Then after exploring the fort, we can get dinner at the hotel and drive where we please afterwards. I suppose there is sea bathing nearby. Dick's idea was unanimously approved and by no one more than Mark. Holidays had been few and far between with him and he anticipated the excursion with the most eager delight. He was only afraid that the weather would prove unpropitious. He was up at four looking out of the window, but the skies were clear and soon the sun came out with full radiance, dissipating the night shadows and promising a glorious day. Breakfast was later than usual as people liked to indulge themselves in a little longer sleep on Sundays and holidays, but it was over by half past eight and within a few minutes from that time the three had taken the cars to Fulton Ferry. In about half an hour the ferry was reached and passing through the party went on board the boat. 
They had scarcely done so when an exclamation of surprise was heard, proceeding from the feminine lips, and Dick heard himself called by name. "'Why, Mr. Hunter, this is an unexpected pleasure. I am so glad to have met you.' Turning his head, Dick recognized Mr. and Mrs. Clifton. Both had been fellow boarders with him in Bleecker Street. The latter will be remembered by the readers of fame and fortune as Miss Peyton. When close upon the verge of old maidenhood, she had been married, for the sake of a few thousand dollars which she possessed by Mr. Clifton, a clerk on a small salary in a constant pecuniary difficulties. With a portion of his wife's money, he had purchased a partnership in a dry goods store on 8th Avenue, but the remainder of her money Mrs. Clifton had been prudent enough to have settled upon herself. Mrs. Clifton still wore the same ringlets and exhibited the same youthful vivacity which had characterized her when an inmate of Mrs. Browning's boarding house, and only owned to being twenty-four, though she looked full ten years older. "'How do you do, Hunter?' drawled Mr. Clifton, upon whose arm his wife was leaning. "'Very well, thank you,' said Dick. "'I see Mrs. Clifton is as fascinating as ever.' "'Oh, you wicked flatterer,' said Mrs. Clifton, shaking her ringlets and tapping Dick on the shoulder with her fan. "'And here is Mr. Fosdick, too, I declare. How do you do, Mr. Fosdick?' "'Quite well, thank you, Mrs. Clifton.' "'I declare I've a great mind to scold you for not coming round to see us. "'I should so much like to hear you sing again.' "'My friend hasn't sung since your marriage, Mrs. Clifton,' said Dick. "'He took it very much to heart. "'I don't think he has forgiven Clifton yet for cutting him out.' "'Mr. Hunter is speaking for himself,' said Fosdick, smiling. "'He has sung as little as I have.' "'Yes, but for another reason,' said Dick. "'I did not think it right to run the risk of driving away the boarders, "'so out of regard to my landlady I repress my natural tendency to warble.' "'I see you're just as bad as ever,' said Mrs. Clifton, in excellent spirits. "'But really, you must come round and see us. "'We're boarding in West 16th Street between 8th and 9th Avenues.' "'If your husband will promise not to be jealous,' said Dick. "'I'm not subject to that complaint,' said Clifton coolly. "'Got a cigar about you, Hunter?' "'No, I don't smoke.' "'No, don't you, though? "'I couldn't get along without it. "'It's my great comfort.' "'Yes, he's always smoking,' said Mrs. Clifton with some asperity. "'Our rooms are so full of tobacco smoke that I don't know, "'but some of my friends will begin to think I smoke myself.' "'A man must have some pleasure,' said Clifton, "'not appearing to be much discomposed by his wife's remarks. "'It may be mentioned that although Mrs. Clifton was always gay and vivacious in company, "'there were times when she could display considerable ill-temper, "'as her husband frequently had occasion to know.' Among the sources of difficulty and disagreement was that portion of Mrs. Clifton's fortune which had been settled upon herself, and of which she was never willing to allow her husband the use of a single dollar. In this, however, she had some justification, as he was naturally a spendthrift, and if placed in his hands, it would soon have melted away. "'Where are you going, Mr. Hunter?' inquired Mrs. Clifton, after a pause. "'Fosdick and I have planned to take a carriage and ride to Port Hamilton.' "'Delightful,' said Mrs. Clifton. "'Why can't we go too, Mr. Clifton?' "'Why, to tell the plain truth,' said her husband, "'I haven't got money enough with me. "'If you'll pay for the carriage, I'm willing to go.' Mrs. Clifton hesitated. She had money enough with her, but was not inclined to spend it. Still, the prospect of making a joint excursion with Richard Hunter and Fosdick was attractive, and she inquired. "'How much will it cost?' "'About five dollars, probably.' "'Then I think we'll go,' she said. "'That is, if our company would not be disagreeable to Mr. Hunter.' "'On the contrary,' said Dick, "'we will get separate carriages, "'but I will invite you both to dine with us "'after visiting the fort.' "'Mr. Clifton brightened up at this "'and straightway became more social and cheerful. "'Mrs. Clifton,' said Richard Hunter, "'I believe I haven't yet introduced you to my ward.' "'Is that your ward?' inquired the lady, "'looking towards Mark. "'What's his name?' "'Mark Manton.' "'How do you like your guardian?' inquired Mrs. Clifton. "'Very much,' said Mark, smiling. "'Then I won't expose him,' said Mrs. Clifton. "'We used to be great friends before I married.' "'Since that sad event I have never recovered my spirits,' said Dick. "'Mark will tell you what a poor appetite I have.' "'Is that true, Mark?' asked the lady. "'I don't think it's very poor,' said Mark with a smile. "'Probably my readers will not consider this conversation very brilliant. "'But Mrs. Clifton was a silly woman who was fond of attention "'and was incapable of talking sensibly.' Richard would have preferred not to have her husband or herself in company, but finding it inevitable, submitted to it with as good a grace as possible. Carriages were secured at a neighboring stable, and the two parties started. The drive was found to be very pleasant, particularly the latter portion when a fresh breeze from the sea made the air delightfully cool. As they drove up beside the fort, they heard the band within playing a march, and giving their horses in charge, they were soon exploring the interior. 
The view from the ramparts proved to be fine, commanding a good view of the harbor and the city of New York, nearly eight miles distant to the north. It is a charming view, said Mrs. Clifton, with girlish enthusiasm. I know what will be more charming, said her husband. What is it? A prospect of the dinner table. I feel awfully hungry. Mr. Clifton never thinks of anything but eating, said his wife. By Jove, you can do your share at that, retorted her husband, not very gallantly. You'd ought to see her eat, Hunter. I don't eat more than a little bird, said Mrs. Clifton affectedly. I appeal to Mr. Hunter. If any little bird ate as much as you, he'd be sure to die of dyspepsy, said her husband. If the words in italics is incorrectly spelled, I am not responsible, and that is the way Mr. Clifton pronounced it. I confess the ride has given me an appetite also, said Dick. Suppose we go round to the hotel and order dinner. They were soon seated round a bountifully spread dinner table, to which the whole party, not excepting Mrs. Clifton, did excellent justice. It will not be necessary or profitable to repeat the conversation which seasoned the repast, as out of deference to Mrs. Clifton's taste, none of the party ventured upon any sensible remarks. After dinner they extended their drive and then parted as Mr. and Mrs. Clifton decided to make a call upon some friends living in the neighborhood. About four o'clock Richard Hunter and his friends started on their return home. They had about reached the Brooklyn City line when Fosdick suddenly exclaimed, "'Dick, there's a carriage overturned a little ways ahead of us. Do you see it?' Looking in the direction indicated, Dick saw that Fosdick was correct. "'Let us hurry on,' he said. "'Perhaps we may be able to render some assistance.' Coming up, they found that a wheel had come off, and a gentleman of middle age was leaning against a tree with an expression of pain upon his features, while a boy of about seventeen was holding the horse. "'Frank Whitney!' exclaimed Dick, in joyful recognition." To Frank Whitney, Dick was indebted for the original impulse which led him to resolve upon gaining a respectable position in society, as will be remembered by the readers of Ragged Dick, and for this he had always felt grateful. Dick, exclaimed Frank in equal surprise, I am really glad to see you. You are a friend in need. Tell me what has happened. The wheel of our carriage came off, as you see, and my uncle was pitched out with considerable violence and has sprained his ankle badly. I was wondering what to do when luckily you came up. "'Tell me how I can help you,' said Dick promptly, "'and I will do so. "'We are stopping at the house of a friend in Brooklyn. "'If you will give my uncle a seat in your carry-all, "'for he is unable to walk, and carry him there, "'it will be a great favor. "'I will remain and attend to the horse and carriage. "'With pleasure, Frank. "'Are you going to remain in this neighborhood long? "'I shall try to gain admission to the sophomore class "'of Columbia College this summer, "'and then shall live in New York, "'where I hope to see you often. "'I intended to enter last year, "'but decided for some reasons to delay a year.' However, if I am admitted to advanced standing, I shall lose nothing. Give me your address, and I will call on you very soon. I am afraid I shall inconvenience you, said Mr. Whitney. Not at all, said Dick promptly. We have plenty of room, and I shall be glad to have an opportunity of obliging one to whom I am indebted for past kindness. Mr. Whitney was assisted into the carriage, and they resumed their drive, deviating from their course somewhat, in order to leave him at the house of a friend with whom he was stopping. I am very glad to have met Frank again, thought Dick. I always liked him. End of section 12 of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Recording by Tori Falder.